Hey guys, it's the final week of our Chosen series, and I hope that this series has challenged and encouraged you in your faith. Yeah, for myself and for Kylie, we have loved sharing these Chosen messages with you and being a small part of your life group experience. But hey, just because Chosen is coming to an end doesn't mean that the principles that we've learned have to as well. That's right, like I learned when you see Ryan Olson running up to you on the street with a camera guy, like run away as fast as you can. Yes, that and all the other reminders we've learned about as well. Like what being chosen by God actually needs to start looking like on a daily basis. I mean, fair, I think both would be things that we've all learned from this. Sure, well, we're about to jump into a message with Nathan about how living life following after Jesus means that your life should not look the same as everyone else. You were chosen to be different. Check it out. If someone followed you around for a week, what would they see? Now let's pretend it's in a totally non-stalkerish kind of way and you don't need to create a restraining order, but imagine if someone followed you around for a week. What would they see? Maybe they would see you at sports games or at the lunch table. Maybe they would see you at your nine to five chipping away emails, connecting with clients or at home with your kids. Maybe they would see you absolutely destroy some Netflix series while hanging out with your best friends, Ben and Jerry. Maybe they'd see you successful around people and see you as the life of the party, but when you're by yourself, maybe they would see you lonelier emptier version of yourself, what would they see? For me, they would see a lot of things. They'd see me hanging out with students in a church. They'd see me with my wife, who I absolutely love. They'd see me in a good book, and they'd see me outside soaking up the sun on a good day or sleeping in on rainy days. But they would see some things I'm not so proud of. They'd see me when I'm tired and I get short with people. They'd see me when I'm anxious and I worry. They'd see me distracted in a quiet time because I'm so focused on what's next. What about you? What would they see? I think we have all of these things that we're not proud of when it comes to our lives, and nobody's perfect. But if people looked at your life, would it look that different from somebody who isn't a Christian? Could someone who didn't already know you know that you follow Christ by the way that you live? If our lives don't look radically different from those who don't follow Christ, it's possible we've lost sight of how closely God wants us to follow him. I've heard it said that you can tell what matters most to a person by how they choose to spend their time and how they choose to spend their money. By the way you choose to spend these things, do they reflect someone who loves God? I have a theory. I might be wrong, but I think it's fairly accurate. As Christians, I think we struggle with one of two things. I think we either struggle to be too separate from the world or we struggle to be too much like the world. God calls us to be different from the world, but he doesn't call us to detach ourselves from the world. And we're supposed to be set apart from the world, but we're not supposed to be separate from the world. God has chosen us to be different, to be holy. Holiness can be defined by being entirely devoted to God. It's our way of saying that God's way of living should impact my daily living. God chose to die for us, so that should influence how we should live for God. And you don't love something that doesn't matter, and you certainly don't die for it. He chose us before the beginning of time and he chose it with you in mind. He died so that he could put our questions in the grave and he came back to life so that we could have life. He wanted us to know that we matter because we are chosen in Christ and we can have eternal life. And this should change how we live. But sometimes it doesn't. Paul, one of the apostles of Jesus, saw this as a problem in the early church too. He saw people miss the point of the gospel, that it's not an excuse to keep sinning, but following Christ should change us radically because it changed Paul radically. Paul's name used to be Saul, and Saul was a Pharisee, a Jewish religious leader. He so intently followed the Jewish customs that he kept himself separate from those who didn't follow the law how he did. And he rejected Jesus so intensely that he put Christians to death. Until one day, he met Jesus, and everything radically changed. His life took a 180, and it wasn't enough for him to say that he followed Christ. Everything had to change about his life. And this change would make him one of the most well-known followers of Christ. But this change would also land him in prisons, persecuted, and eventually put to death for his faith in Jesus. Paul knew that following Jesus should cause us to live differently. So he wrote a letter to the church in Rome because he wanted to call these Christians to a better way of living. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, 
pleasing and perfect will. Paul recognizes that our bodies and our lives are sacrifices. God doesn't measure our lives by how successful we live on earth. It's measured by how well we sacrifice. And Paul writes that this sacrifice is holy and pleasing. It's a holy thing. It's a pleasing thing for us to make decisions that elevate God and humble ourselves. We aren't called to conform to this world because this world is not our home. But instead, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Not so that we can become super smart or successful, but so that we can know what God's will is for our lives and so that we can follow him. Paul could have said it like this. Be different by living differently. Don't blend into the rest of the world, but stand out. Stand out for how well you sacrifice and how well you are transformed. So because God chose us to be holy, how do we choose to live holy? First challenge I'll share is that we can't be set apart if we don't choose to set apart time for God. If someone were looking at the way you choose to spend your time, is there anything that shows that you set apart time for God? Right now, you've set apart time to be with your life group and to enjoy accountability, but what else? Would they see consistent church attendance? Would they see a daily time spent with God? Would they see time set apart to serve other people? Because if we aren't serving, we probably aren't sacrificing. What do you need to do to set apart time for God? Maybe we need to stop scrolling on Instagram for hours on end to free up time for him. We might have to prioritize spending time with God at church over kids' sports schedules that dominate our calendar. We might have to wake up a little earlier and withdraw from the noise of life to spend time with God. Even Jesus withdrew to spend time with his father. After one of Jesus' coolest miracles of feeding the 5,000, he does something unexpected. Jesus had just performed a miracle where he fed 5,000 people from five loaves of bread and two fish. After they got done eating, John records this. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The crowd, the people who just saw the miracle were like, this is our guy, let's make him our king. But Jesus did something so opposite of what you and I would have done. He withdrew by himself. He didn't take autographs, he didn't accept the praise, but he withdrew. Why? I think he knew that you can't be set apart unless you set apart time to be with God. Jesus could have been king over Israel, but God had plans for him to be king over sin. Jesus chose a life that was centered that didn't live for himself, but a modeled one that had such dependence on God through humility. And then the next thing to do to live a life of holiness is to choose to grow in love with God. So many times we think that holiness is just not sinning. Jesus didn't give his life on the cross so that we could just say no to bad stuff. Jesus gave his life on the cross so that we could give our lives to him, not just out of obligation, but out of love. Holiness is the process of not conforming to what the world says and being transformed by what God says. When we learn to love God, our hearts will follow. And when we love God more, it should cause us to love people more. What I know to be true is that you don't accidentally keep growing in love. It takes intentional choosing to keep growing in love because love is a choice. I know this is true for me and even in my marriage. I have to choose to make time and I have to choose to put the pursuit of love as a priority. When I choose to set apart time to get to know my wife, it changes me. I'm not just trying to keep from disappointing her, I'm trying to know her heart, to learn more about her, to see what she's passionate about and how I can better serve her. When we set apart time for the sake of growing in love rather than just following rules, it changes us. If you want a relationship with someone and the whole goal was not to break some rules, how committed would you be to that relationship? Maybe you need to just sit with God this week and just remember the simple joy of salvation. Remember that God gave you his one and only son. Remember that we were once dead, but in Christ we can have eternal life. Maybe you need to sit and look at the beauty of his creation and let it point back to the beauty of the creator. A.W. Tozer said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'm afraid that we're giving far more attention to so many other things and neglecting the process of growing in love with God. If what comes into our minds when we think about God isn't radically different from somebody who isn't following God, we've got some work to do. If what comes into our minds when we think about God doesn't radically influence how we live, we've got some work to do. Holiness is so much more than not sinning. It's living a life for God. 
So set apart time with God to be set apart and let God change you by growing more in love with him. Choose to be holy because God chose us and because God has chosen us, it should change how we live. So this next week, if that same person followed you around, what would they see different from last week? My prayer is that the love of God and the time with God changes you from the inside out. So choose to be different by living differently. Um, I grew up with uh, an alcoholic father, um, and I, you know, I thought that drinking was a normal day-to-day -day thing. Uh, I went down to uh, college, and um, that's where I kind of started investigating myself and being more independent. I surrounded myself uh, with a lot of uh, friends who um, acted out. Um, we rarely went to church. Um, my parents divorced um, because of my, my father's uh, drinking. Um, and that's what kind of started the, um, the downhill spiral for me. Uh, but I didn't really realize that until about 15 years later. So Growing up, I was involved in the church and tried to serve as much as I could. But the older I got, I drifted away and um, just started to do things um, where I wanted to be center of of my life and do things according to, to my will. Got into a marriage that ended up in divorce. Um, realized that was in it for the wrong reasons. I remember crying out to God and praying um, that, you know, for his forgiveness if I had made the wrong um, decision with that marriage. And I, I felt that God was prompting me not to get married and I, I didn't listen to him. I just remember sitting in the nursery with, um, who's now my four-year-old, and just praying for God to give me some sort of sign and, and way out, basically, because I wanted to experience joy and happiness and lived for him. I too, like Amanda, um, got married to my, what I thought was, a, was a, a college sweetheart. We got a divorce and, you know, things um, quickly spiraled downhill for me. Uh, I did what I knew what I thought was well, the right thing to do um, to, to avoid my feelings, and that was to, to drink. So it was about uh, two and a half, uh, three years ago, where uh, I, I just decided, you know, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I ended up uh, voluntarily, you know, uh, admitting myself to a, a treatment center in Anderson. Um, this is where I found God. You know, I, I, I had to get to uh, rock bottom in order uh, to find the true healing um, and grace and glory that I, that I needed. Um, every Sunday in that um, treatment center, we ended up in uh, the Anderson campus at Northview Church. And we were sitting in the back of, of the uh, campus and um, you know, I, I raised my hand as I was bawling you know, my eyes out you know, um, that I wanted to accept Christ in my life that day. You know, it was a, the most, uh, and I'm, I'm speechless, you know, and just talking about this, you know, several years later, um, because that was the turning point that changed my life uh, and that I decided to give my life to Christ. I prayed specifically for things um, too, that I wanted, to, I wanted to experience joy and love with a godly man. Someone who was humble, I wanted someone who was, um, who would lead us, and even um, so much as the um, doing a book study together. And so when um, I met Adam um, on Christian Mingle, um, soon, soon after the, that, I mean the first day I think we talked on the phone, he asked me if I would be willing to do a book study together on the Purpose Driven Life. And I remember thinking how cool that God is going to the details of answering that specific prayer of someone who would lead us with um, digging into God's Word together. She means to me, I, I feel like you know she has been this miracle, this angel person that has just came down from heaven to, to give me love and hope and happiness and joy. Um, and come to find out, you know, she went through a very similar struggle in her life. Um, and, and that's, you know, just, it's just an unbelievable miracle of how transformation through Jesus can come to anyone. 
What an incredible story from Adam and Amanda. So inspiring. Yeah, we were absolutely chosen to live differently in this world. And I hope that you were challenged to think about what that looks like for you. Yeah, we all have a next in our relationship with God, whether we are brand new to all of this or we've been a Christian most of our lives. We wanna walk you through an exercise to answer the question, what is an area in my life that I want to grow in that matters to me? Once you decide where you wanna grow, then you'll want to decide what you want to do over the next 90 days to focus on that. If you look at page 13 in your books, you'll see a bunch of different suggestions on possible areas in which you could focus on growing, or you can also choose your own. Yeah, like if you don't have a regular quiet time with God, then this is the place to start. Make that your next. And we've even created a healthy habit trainer to help you get started. If you do have a healthy, regular quiet time, then choose an area that you wanna lean into for this next season. Also, text CHOSEN to 85379 and you'll be sent a page that is just like page 13 in your chosen book. Fill that out as well and we will send you additional resources for the area that you wanna grow in. As you get into your group discussion, start with your planning on making your next. This is a great way for others to help keep you accountable and to really make your next happen. Well guys, we have loved hosting you the last six weeks and we just wanna offer one last encouragement that you have been chosen. What will you choose to do? We love you guys. We'll see you later.